Hello. <coughs> it's weird. So it's my first time doing a presentation, so just to let you know. Um, okay. Um, today we'll talk about shaders and VFX. Um, just to uh, tell you in advance, we won't go very deep into code and details. We will vaguely uh, speak about ways how to achieve certain effects and stuff. Um, so, the first thing we'll talk about is planar reflections. Um, and this is what, we, what you will not completely learn to do, but you will understand how it works. And uh, the project uh, and source code for everything will be available on Google Drive, which will be linked to, I don't know, Facebook, yeah. Slovian web, <coughs> later, or whatever. So any questions you have after that, you can send me an email or write to me directly or whatever. So let's begin. So how do we do planar reflections? Um, so to achieve this kind of effect, we have to render the scene with a secondary camera, which we'll call a reflection camera. And the way we have to render the scene uh, with reflection camera, it has to be um, it has to be mirrored over the plane we are trying to render the reflections. So you see that the square with the sign at the bottom. So uh, we have to uh, mirror the, posi the position and also mirror the x and z uh, rotation values of the camera. So in order to flip everything. Uh, I will skip the code. I can show it later in the Unity, how it is done. It is done with the matrix. Um, it's not that hard. So uh, the next thing that's important with plan reflections is you never want to have uh, stuff being rendered below the plane you uh, want to show the reflections on. So the way we achieve this, uh, Aras from Unity posted a nice piece of code to actually achieve that projection matrix, which is called oblique matrix. Uh, and what it does is if you look at the box, the gray box, this is a normal orthographic projection. So what the oblique matrix does, it converts it to, to actually a first time that you can see that goes from the blue to the red square on top. And what we get for free with this uh, oblique matrix is that uh, the blue square is actually the near clipping plane, and everything below the clipping plane is actually below and it's not rendered. So this is actually what we want because nothing below should be rendered at all in the reflection. Uh, I will show the code for this later as well, and it's also in the project. Uh, so to actually composite everything together, this is like the first step. Is a normal render. It's what the player sees, uh, and then when we reflect the camera over the plane, we get the reflection render, which you can see on the second picture. And after that, to, to actually composite everything together, it's not written here, but th there's two ways you can do it. Uh, one way is to like render a full screen quad and then mask everything out and just uh, blend in the reflections. But I didn't do it like that. I won't talk about. Uh, this uh, way here, but uh, how I did it, and I think other people do it as well, is uh, you just calculate the screen space uh, UV coordinates from the plane we're rendering the reflections to. If you're familiar with screen space, screen space UV coordinates, it's a simple way Unity has like a function in a, it's called a screen post, or something like that, compute screen position. So uh, you just input like a vertex and you get, you get the UV coordinates in screen space. So basically from 0 to 1, I think left to right, <laughs> accordingly. Um, so you actually, when you have these coordinates, you just take the reflection render and project it on the plane. Uh, and the way to control the reflective value is simply by lurking between uh, the original texture which is on the plane and the uh, the one which is a reflection render um, with like a value that goes from 0 to 1 uh, and you can achieve this uh, effect. So like uh, actually I will um, quickly um, open the scene in the background for later to, to, to show a bit of shader code and exactly how screen space coordinates are calculated and stuff like that. Uh, 
Okay, so when this is loading, I will quickly switch back to like pros and cons. Uh, not a lot of pros and not a lot of cons. I believe it could find more, but I guess these are the most important ones. So like the pros are, it's relatively simple to implement. You can do a really, really simple implementation. You can position the camera by hand for static scenes and just have it like that. Or you can go really far and automate everything so it reflects through a matrix and that all the rotations work and everything looks correct. Uh, the second pro is you get fully reflected objects, uh, which actually relates to uh, screen space reflections. If you know screen space reflections, the downside of screen space reflections is you can't reflect what's not visible on the screen. So usually uh, in games this is shown uh, in a way that if you look at like water and you have uh, some object above your head, like, uh, like a tree or leaves or anything, you will see that the sky is not reflected uh, from those points and stuff is just weird. I believe you all encountered this uh, in other games, which is uh, screen space reflections. So in this case, also the bottom parts of the invisible parts of the uh, objects are reflected since we're doing a full render of uh, the whole scene. So the cons, it can be expensive because we're rendering the whole scene again. Uh, uh, one thing to note maybe if we're using forward renderers, it can be even more expensive if we're using a lot of point lights since uh, every point light is then end to the pixel shader again, but if we're using the further rendering, that doesn't matter. Uh, and the con, another one is it only works on flat surfaces, you know, which why it's called planar reflections as well. So this is mostly used for like waters and mirrors uh, and stuff like that. Um, so if we, I think the scene is open. Oh, let me quickly show. Oh. Planar reflections. So this is how it looks in the game. Um, it's an example that will be available online. Um, and just to quickly show, uh, uh, no. yeah. uh, I wrote a standard shader. It's not a unleash fully custom, so I just extended the existing. Unity stuff, um, just to show that there's not so much code as soon as this opens up. If it will open, it doesn't work. Okay. When you have a presentation, nothing works. Apparently. No, just I don't know. Uh, <coughs> okay. Let's take another one. No. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why doesn't it work? Okay. I don't get this. Okay. Um, okay. So this this is the shader. Um, so we we just have uh, uh, it's down here. a uniform sample to D, a reflection render texture which we feed in through the C sharp script. Uh, from the other reflection camera. And the way we render it on the surface, this, this shader of course is running on the plane that the reflections are rendered to. Uh, so the way you get the screen position coordinates is uh, like this. So this is all the three lines you need in order to sample in screen space. So you just, oh, you may notice the Y is flipped. So this, this is because uh, the scene is rendered mirrored, so we have to uh, flip the Y coordinate. We either do that in a project in the matrix, in the camera code uh, in the first place, or you can do it in the shader. I just decided to do it in the shader. Uh, so, so this is all the code required to project the reflection. Uh, okay, so any questions about this you can ask later in Q and A. Uh, or you can do it now, whatever you prefer. <laughs> um, I guess we can do it later. Um, so yeah, these are the planar reflections. Um, this is the first part. So the second part is maybe... Uh, a, it's
it's more little stuff. <laughs> Combined. So it's the kitty cocktails, it's a game with it and juicy pixels. Um, so things we're going to talk about is how to like uh, produce a semi-realistic liquid simulation. Uh, the second part is uh, like how to render this liquid only inside the glass. Uh, then how we render the safe and perfect lines. Those are, those are the two green zones you see on the glass. Uh, it was relatively easy. Another interesting thing was how to simulate the volume as the glass filled. We kind of wanted to achieve a fake feeling of uh, like the narrower spaces were filled up faster than white spaces, if that makes sense. Uh, and the last part was uh, we had to mask the liquid stream, which is the water that comes down from the tap. We had to mask it so it didn't render below uh, the, the water surface. Um, that required a really small amount of shadow work to actually get around that. We'll see that. So let's talk about the first thing, the, how to make this liquid. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is to uh, dynamically generate a mesh. I mean, you don't have to dynamically generate it, you can have it pre-made, but I think it's more like, it's better to have it dynamic since you have more options. Uh, the way we have so many vertices here is because we used vertex color to make your gradients on the liquid itself, so we added some extra data right there. Um, so once we have the, oh, by the way, <laughs> this on the right is really ugly, because uh, I hacked it a bit, uh, just to show that it was used for gradients. Uh, so uh, this is the first part, uh, generating the mesh. And the second part is springs. You've all heard about springs, probably. Most of you implemented them, probably. <laughs> uh, so it, this is the code. It's not much. We actually used relay integration to, to achieve the spring effect. Uh, the code will also be available uh, online. Uh, we won't go into details. Uh, so that's the first part, you need a spring, uh, and the way we use springs, we attach them to, uh, like if you focus on the vertical lines, each of the vertical lines have a spring attached to it. So like, it began at the bottom, it ended at the top, like, uh, it's, it's natural length was whatever, okay, so <laughs> springs on each uh, vertical line, and uh, this by itself is not enough to uh, to achieve the, the watery liquid field. So another thing you need to do to, to actually achieve this is to distribute the, uh, the difference in uh, height of springs. You have to distribute it to neighboring springs, right? So uh, this is actually how this is done. Um, I did this, uh, I found an article online. Uh, a guy did a very similar thing. So, so actually, you just um, you just calculate all the deltas. You just take basically a height of one spring and height of neighbor spring. Calculate the difference in height, and uh, you multiply that by some uh, some spread factor, uh, and then add it to each neighbor or subtract it depending on the value. So, so this is what kind of produces uh, the effect of if you take one spring and pull it really far up, uh, the others will kind of follow. Uh, so uh, this, is the, this is the spring part. This is what makes the whole liquid move. And the way we move the liquid was to actually, you can see the add force function here. We just moved uh, one spring up or down and this actually caused, and we just let it go and that caused the the, the way we feel and you distribute the, the, the change across all the mesh. Uh, so, uh, if we continue on. Um, to, actually, the next part was to, when we had this liquid, we had to kind of render it inside the glass and inside the glass only. So, the way we did this, um, we, we, um, we positioned the uh, dynamic mesh which we created exactly on the same position and uh, width and height to the glass, as you see in the example on the left. So, so the liquid is actually uh, matches the glass width. Uh, uh, another part was we, we rendered the liquid with a separate camera. 
which, uh, like the liquid, had similar settings. The thrust room had to be the same as the glass. As you see, the thrust room of the orthographic camera it matches the like the render bounds of the of the glass, right? So why we did this was that we didn't need any special magic to to then later um, blend it in the shape that we just read the render texture that was produced by the camera and we just blended it in. Um, so the way we actually masked it was with the alpha texture of the, of the glass. So um, this, is, uh, this is this. And then like for the safe and perfect lines, it, this is, was really simple. We had a setting for each glass uh, that defined uh, where the lines will be and how wide they were. We just fed that positions to the shader and do some nasty little ifs to compare whether uh, <laughs> it was in, in, a, in a certain zone uh, and colored each line appropriately. Um, so this was the simplest part. And then uh, the next interesting part was to simulate the volume. Um, and how we did this? Oh, maybe this is not so much shader VFX talk, but it's all really tightly connected, in my opinion. So the way we simulated the volume, uh, we, we pre-processed all the glasses. We wanted to kind of automate this process to, to not do it by hand for 60, 70, 80 glasses, whatnot. Uh, and the way we did this was we pre-calculated this curve, you see that? So the x-axis represents the volume and the y-axis represents the progress in percent. What I mean by that is zero means that the liquid is at the complete bottom and one means it's, it's at the complete top. So, so the amount of volume you actually put to the animation curve will tell you how much the, the glass will be filled. And as you see, uh, as the glass gets narrower, the curve gets steeper. So uh, how we actually then dynamically uh, make this move is when we when you press the, <laughs> on the screen, when you touch the screen, we not only start the particle system, of course, but we produce invisible points which have actually gravity that matches the, the, the water stream. And each, each, of those, each of the points that fall below the surface of the water adds a certain amount of volume to the glass. Uh, and this, so each time that happens, we accumulate all the uh, volume right, over time and just sample the curve and raise the spring level, uh, the, rest, the, rest, the rest length of the springs, so that everything then goes up. And to actually produce the waves, we just uh, move the center vertex up and down, and the left and the right vertices, we move them up and down, so it produces like a wave motion. Uh, I think it looks kind of cool, and it feels, uh, it feels natural when you fill the glasses, so this enabled us to have a, like a consistent feel over the whole game, over all glasses, and it was all automated. Um, Okay, so this was this is the simulating volume part, and then how to mask the liquid stream. This is a very useful actual trick that I think is used in a lot of games when you try to mask something. And uh, so <coughs> on the left side, it's an example of how this <coughs> looks like when you see it from different angles. And the way it works is um, we use a very simple shader, which we call the Z mask, which uh, has a color mask, color mask zero line, which actually means that uh, whatever is being rendered, uh, whatever mesh geometry is being rendered by this shader, won't write to the frame buffer. Uh, RGB and alpha values, none of that will be written to the frame buffer. And the Z write on means that it will write to the Z or the depth buffer of the. Uh, so. Then, the, I mean, if, when you think about it, how the graphics pipeline, uh, how rendering works, uh, so everything that, like, uh, there is depth testing, depth culling, which, which the only thing it does is it checks before it renders something, is there anything that was rendered here before? And if it is, 
just don't render this because um, this is how you how we save on performance as well. So, and the way this is used in this trick is uh, the the quad on the left, which you can see, which has four little points on each side. So, so that thing actually writes to the depth buffer, and when uh, when I will say this very weirdly, when the graphics card wants to render the water stream, it won't render it because there is something already written in the depth buffer on that location and it will just ignore it. So, so this is a neat little trick you can use uh, to, to mask certain things from your scene. So, and another part to this was to, to actually raise the top level of this quad to match the water surface. So that way we got everything masked out from the bottom of the surface, from, I mean from the top of the sur surface, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, this was this trick. Um, this was the liquid stream. Okay, so the, this is actually the whole, the whole thing from the Kitty cocktails, how, how we made the filling of the, of the glasses. And it's, I have more content. I can show you uh, different stuff, uh, but I can't squeeze it into this talk. So maybe if there is interest, I can uh, explain the other topic on the next talk. Uh, but first, let's uh, do some Q&A about this stuff. If there is any questions, uh, regarding reflections uh, or anything regarding the water or anything regarding shaders uh, in general that you would like to ask. Uh, what happens if the container got full? What kind of effects did you do? Uh, well, we tried to. <laughs> we were <laughs> nice. We, we, uh, we tried to do a full simulation with, uh, with actual liquid, like the one you see in Blender or Maya or whatever. Uh, but it was too expensive. It was also very hard. Uh, and in the amount of time we had, we just couldn't do that. So in order to go around this, uh, we just detected at which point the input should be cancelled. That when it is cancelled, it will just go to the top and stop. <laughs> so uh, this is how we solved it. Yeah. How performant was this? I mean, because for each process you have like on stream, mm -hmm. you did this on CPU cycles, right? Not yes. On yes. How, how performant was this? Uh, it was only one glass per, like, it was only one active mesh per scene. Mm -hmm. So it was, the amount of vertices was always the same. So. 2030, something like that, and this is, uh, it wasn't heavy, it didn't show, even on weak devices, everything worked normally, with 60 frames, so uh, performance was not an issue in this case. Does the edge of the glass affect the water? I, I'm loud. The edge of the glass? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the edge of the glass? Uh, the Sorry, I don't does does the edge of the glass affect how the wave goes? Oh, no, 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 actually it doesn't. So if we go back like to this to this slide, if you look at the middle picture, we uh, we always set the width of the this dynamic water to the max width of uh, yeah. the whole sprite. Uh, so yeah. it doesn't. It, it's just all fake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just move it a bit. And it looks cool. So, mm. uh, any other questions? How yeah. did you mask uh, like, when, you're, yeah. when you draw yeah. the green line? How did you mask the like, border of the glass? How did we? Uh -huh, so, it, so, so it doesn't render the what is outside. Yeah. Um, we rendered it to a texture, and we fed it to a shader, the glass shader we had, and uh, we just used used this. Uh, Mask, you see the outer mask here. Um, <coughs> and just, yeah, we just basically masked it with this, and um, it only rendered inside. Um, so, yeah, okay. Uh, you, you said that this liquid thing has two cameras, if I understood correctly. Why two cameras? Why not just one and then spawn in the thing? Um, I mean, no particular reason. When I, 
did this, I, just, uh, I will render the liquid separately. Uh, I mean, I, I think like the main reason was um, the main reason was I wanted to uh, match the liquid <coughs> to the glass, and uh, the reason for the second camera was to have uh, orthographic size match the render bounds on the glass. So that produced like a texture, which I can, which we then just fed into the glass shader and just oh, actually okay. simply blended it in with the mask and everything worked uh, perfectly. So we didn't have to do any adjustments or stuff like that. So I believe that was the main reason for rendering the, the separate camera. Follow up? Yeah. So is the alpha, is the alpha auto generated then? No. Uh, all the RGB and alpha textures were produced by uh, an artist, and we just like we've written a script that imported everything and generated the volume, the volume curves, and everything. Um, so yes, we just needed those two textures for everything to work. Oh, and there is uh, one interesting thing. One one thing that we couldn't get around was uh, we we were limited to glasses that were that didn't have any obstructions. Uh, where the water stream was coming down because we couldn't simulate water going around and then down. So, but it was not a problematic limitation. A limitation we could still do a lot uh, of variations with it. Yeah. Why didn't you use mask for the, for the finishing lines and for the save zones? Why did you use if uh, because they were dynamic. Uh, they, like it was a certain difficulty. Every class had five difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, and each difficulty had a different size height of uh, a safe, the bottom line, and the perfect uh, top line. So. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. so, uh, and it wasn't that heavy <laughs> <laughs> with the if statements and all. Uh, so, yeah. um, if you would like, I can show you another, another thing I did which I wanted to include in this presentation, but was like too much to, to, to squeeze in this half an hour, which I think has passed already. Three minutes. Oh, nice. I wonder how I did that. Um, so, I saw these interesting articles on Twitter, not articles, but like tweets on Twitter, uh, about grass and stomping grass and stuff like that. Uh, and I like wanted to try it out, and I didn't find any Unity implementations for this, so I just said, hey, let's try to do it. Um, so this is it, uh, exclusively for artist stuff. It's not like the best grass you've ever seen. Uh, but uh, so let me just show you what this is. Um, so uh, hopefully this works. Um, so the grass gets stomped and it remains stomped and then it kind of corrects itself back to where it was before. Um, so, uh, if you would like to know how this is done in detail, uh, I can maybe do a talk on some other, some other day. Um, but I, if you want, I can quickly just explain the procedure. Of, okay, so, really quickly. <laughs> um, it is not as hard as you might think, um, but so the thing the thing to note, the first thing we need is, uh, um, sorry, I need to structure a bit. Um, um, the, way, the way we make, you can make the grass be permanently stomped is by using a particle system. Uh, I, I do it by emitting, uh, emitting particles along the stair and just actually use the particle systems color over lifetime and size over lifetime to, to control the, how, wide, how wide it is, how narrow it is, and how quickly it disappears. And there is one little step that has to be done here, and this is what we actually render with the, with the particle systems. And it is basically radial directions that go from the center. So if I focus on this quad over here, you can see 
this is this is a single particle that gets emitted uh, through the particle system. So what this represents is uh, a direction from the center to. to Sorry, the presentation is over. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so this just represents uh, direction, like if you imagine direction like this, and it goes around and around. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. Um, and the way this is done, uh, it's relatively simple. Mm -hmm. No, it's reflections. Uh, will it open? Of course not. Why would it? So this is the shader for the particle render, and uh, actually all I do is uh, these three lines just make a radial mask, um, a radial alpha mask, which masks the so it makes it look like a circle, so it's not like a square. Right? So it's just a procedural mask, a circular mask with a fall off. Um, this is the first part, and then this is the second part. It's the direction from the center. You just shift the coordinate system to the center, normalize it, and multiply it back, and just shift it back. <laughs> so um, then you actually output that uh, like this. I write the x and y direction values to the x and y component of the color. And I write the mask in the alpha, which will then also be later used to scale the grass a bit. So so it kind of looks a bit better. Uh, so this is the first part. So the rendering of the particle system. Uh, if I manage to make this work. So this looks like that, right? It's just a particle system that emits that radial color stuff. Um, so when you have that, you need to kind of capture it in a render texture. And the way I did this was I just placed a grass camera on top with a really huge size, as you can see. Because uh, we don't need so many details here. Uh, we don't need to preserve so many details, so the size of the orthographic camera can be really big. And the resolution doesn't have to be huge as well. What I'm using is uh, 1K resolution for the render texture. Uh, so when you, when you have that render, um, oh, one more detail. Uh, as you can see, the grass camera has a clear color set to this kind of yellowish color. This is because when we sample the, the texture later on, this will actually give this will actually give us a color of zero. Because in, in textures, you might know that we can store negative values. We can in a render texture, I guess. I think, I think we can store uh, negative values in render texture. Uh, it's possible, but I did it like that. So. In order to store a direction which can go from negative 1 to positive 1, right, the x and y values respectively, um, you can store uh, that as a color, so you need to convert it from minus 1, 1 range to 0, 1 range. Um, and when you actually take uh, this yellow color and convert it back to minus 1, 1 range, you get 0. Uh, so this is the reason why the color is yellow. <laughs> um, okay, so. So, uh, after we have this nice particle system and we have it rendered to the texture, the next step is to uh, project that texture um, on the grass vertex itself. So, the way this is done, uh, if I open up uh, the displacement shape, there is a lot of values here. Okay, so this is the grass render texture, which is then, of course, fed through the C sharp script. Um, uh, and the way we use this, so first we need to calculate the projected UVs. This is done by taking the grass camera matrix, which is uh, the world to local matrix multiplied by the projection matrix, which is actually in the end like the view matrix. And when you multiply this by the vertex position, you get you get uh, you get projected UVs the way they look from uh, the grass camera. So to actually maybe imagine this a bit better is to if if we take the example on the left, 
if I would if we were to, sh to display the uh, the UVs the co as as a color, right? The project if, you, if we would display the projected UVs as colors, you would get uh, like the x would, would go from minus one to one uh, from the random bound, not, not random bound, from the from the orthographic like uh, first one, right? So on the left you would have minus one, on the right you would have one. Um, same goes for white. Um, I could maybe demonstrate this actually with the color, but since I didn't have prepared the presentation for this, it's maybe a bit more hard to imagine. Um, so this is how you do it. You, you uh, project the UVs, um, and you have to convert it from minus one, one range to zero one range, which we will then use to actually sample the texture, because we need the zero one range for the sampling. And then, mm, after that, we, um, we sample the texture in the vertex shader, and this requires us to have OpenGL 3 or higher, so mobile devices and this kind of effect will not work well on our platforms, of course. On newer ones, yes, but not on all of them. Uh, so you sample the texture, and then we uh, convert the directions the colors back to directions. As you remember, we stored different kind of range in the texture. Now we have to convert it back to also get the ne negative directions back from the texture. So once we have that, um, ignore the scaling. This is just the scaling from the alpha. It's not so important. So then we use we simply use the directions sampled from the map to rotate the vertices and. To rotate the vertices, you have to use a bit of a weird rotation matrix function, which I found online. Of course, I don't understand the, the math behind this. Uh, not completely, but uh, this is what you use, and this is what I used in a lot of shaders, since it's a useful function to have somewhere stored, because uh, you can use it, and you will, if you work with shaders, use it a lot of times. So, we can rotate the vertices using that matrix uh, around those directions, and that's it. <laughs> you then have this stuff, I guess. So, so this is what, how you achieve this effect of uh, stunned grass. Uh, you could, I think, use a similar thing for snow, um, or you could simplify it. Uh, I've seen people do this same effect without the permanent trails, they just use the, they just fed the character position to the shader from a script and then used those directions to, to just displace at the position of the character. So this is just actually a step forward to, to render everything through a particle system to a texture so it has a trail. Uh, okay. Um, any like questions regarding this? This code will also be available, by the way, for the grass online, so you can check it out. How do you render the grass? I mean, where do you, I mean, the stables? I mean, I know that the set that now that you use this, um, uh, say this, uh, this colors for like rotation, but where actually like is this in the frag machine or vertex machine? Like, where do you like uh, offset these uh, vertices? How where do I rotate them? Yeah, uh -huh, in the vertex trader itself. So. This is the vertex function, and in the vertex function, after we get the rotations from the map, do I need to zoom this out? Zoom, zoom this in a bit. Sorry. Okay. It's better. So this is where the actual rotation happens. So the vertex is rotated by the rotation matrix uh, around the x-axis by a direction and some like multipliers. To, to adjust how much the grass actually bends. Uh, this is done like twice for both axes, like the x and y. And then you just normally, uh, I mean, you just assign it and rotate it basically using that rotation matrix function. Uh, one thing to note here um, one problem with this implementation is that when uh, the, the vertices actually rotate, you can see that 
kind of the whole grass um, bundle rotates uh, around a single pivot point, which is not ideal. Uh, so if we focus maybe on one little piece of grass. Sorry. Okay, so what happens in the shader is when we rotate those vertices, they will rotate around this zero zero pivot or lower pivot, right? So so everything will rotate, kind of. Um, I do mask it with uh, a, a Y UV coordinate, since the Y UV coordinate goes from zero to one, from top to bottom, right? And I just multiply the rotation factor by the Y UV coordinate, so only the top vertices actually get rotated. Because if the bottom vertices got rotated as well, it wouldn't look like anything uh, at all. So, and to continue from before, one thing to note is to make this better, there are two things you could do. One thing is you could store the pivot points in the vertices from like a script in a Blender or Maya. You could bake them in colors or secondary UV channels or whatever you want. Uh, and then rotate around those pivot points. Uh, second thing you can do is, one guy did this with the Unreal implementation, I think, was to actually fake the pivot points and just rotate around. He, he just took the top point from the rest and moved it straight down to the floor and rotated around that pivot. And kind of looked okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, this <coughs> other question. Yes? Uh, I have a question about the player reflections. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you made it look really simple, kind of. Mm -hmm. And is this like the same system that you use to make actual mirrors in games? Actual what? Sorry? Mirrors. Oh, the planar reflection part. Yes. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the same thing could be used for mirrors. Uh, you just rotate the plane on one axis to 90 degrees and reflect the camera accordingly over that plane and everything should work. Um, yeah. Um, except, yeah, there are corner cases. If you have like a single mirror, uh, I actually didn't think about that. Um, yeah, because it's like it's in games, mirrors are almost always shit. Like mm -hmm. They never look good. Mm -hmm. um, so, why is that? Um, I mean, I've seen Unreal implementations. They have some weird screen space hacks they do, combined with, I think, some extra camera rendering. Um, but I've seen actual mirror implementations in games which are done with, uh, with uh, additional camera. Um, so, I think like the ones that are completely correct are done with a separate camera as well. So just the, the way they implement it probably differs. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think the main problem here is that uh, in like AAA games, you're already uh, at the watch of the of your uh, um, vertex count uh, and uh, pixel uh, limit, um, and if you just add another camera. You will just run out of performance because yeah. you have to render the whole scene, the whole scene maybe from the other angle, but again, and this is just it's usually just too much. Yeah, I mean you could you could only reflect the player or something like that, but but yeah, I guess from the same reason it's avoided. Um,